today. Blaze asked me if I'd be willing to share a few words for Father's Day, so here I am. Before I was a dad, I wasn't 100% sure exactly what to expect. I was looking forward to it, and I was excited for it, but I maybe had some pretty big expectations for myself. I mean, really, who doesn't? Everyone wants to strive to be a better father than the one that they had growing up, whether he was a good guy or a bad guy. I actually thought fatherhood was going to have some rough days, but overall, life was going to slow down a little bit. And I seriously said that. But now I know that nothing can prepare you for the things that you really know nothing about. I've learned a lot since the day I took Isaiah into my arms, and I've learned even more since the day I took Jairus into my arms. I think one of the biggest things I've learned about myself since becoming a father is how selfish I truly am. When it is just you and your wife, it's easy to be selfish and not know it. She can do her thing, you can do your thing, but as long as you still make time for each other, it's going to work out. But when a child comes into your life, your whole life seems to be turned upside down, and my selfish side had a real big problem with that at first. The house was not always the way I thought it would be. I couldn't just do whatever I wanted when I wanted. Everything was a lot more of a chore with a child. We couldn't just jump on a plane in the middle of winter and escape the escape to warmer weather. Lisa was and is uh, patient with me, and for that I'm grateful. She's a, an amazing godly woman, and it's uh, she's been a, a huge blessing to me as well. Another thing that I've learned is that blessings do come in small packages. These two little guys, I, I love them more than anything that I I love in the world and and uh, they have been way more of a blessing to me than I could ever be to them and, and it's just been a, an amazing journey and I can't wait to see where it leads to being a father is a role that needs to be taken seriously it's an important role it's a hard role lives depend on you to take this role of fatherhood head-on one thing that always stood out to me was a quote from James Dobson, which is, discipline your children today so the justice system won't have to do it tomorrow. Those words were true when he said it, and they're, they're true today. Being a father has taught me a lot about patience and the importance of having them. This is still a work in progress. With that being said, the patience of God, our Heavenly Father, has had with me in my life is an unmistakable true love. I gave him many opportunities to take me out with the snap of a finger or the blink of an eye before I repented or put my trust in him. 
but his patience, his love, his kindness, his grace and mercy upon me has brought me to where I am today. He waited for me to come to him for over 25 years, and even when I had my back to turn to him, for all those hours, weeks, months, and years, he never stopped loving me. He patiently waited for me, just a simple little lo lost sheep. I just want to read 1 Timothy 1.16. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you today, and I hope you all have a very blessed Father's Day. Good morning, Trinity. Blaze asked me to say good morning to you, welcome, and to share my thoughts on fatherhood in 30 seconds. <laughs> or grandfatherhood. Mm, well, okay. <laughs> Might be a little easier. Um, I had the pleasure of spending last week with John and Valerie and Letitia as we went up north to meet the family. I'm already at 30 seconds. And uh, the family up in the north. The fishing wasn't too good, but the time spent with family was wonderful. Valerie behaved herself so well in the car. And now I find that this week I'm missing her. So... You know, I think that's part of it. Being a dad is just simply loving being with family. I love being with my dad. I love being with my kids. And now I love being with my grandkids. Okay, 60 seconds. I'm done. Have a great morning. <laughs>
Good morning, Trinity, and also welcome to any who are watching our service online. I do want to say happy Father's Day to all of the dads who are watching right now. Uh, this is your day, and I do hope that you feel encouraged. I also am praying that this message today will be one that not only encourages you, but also challenges you to be a father that more fully represents the character of your Heavenly Father, as we are going to see as we look at our text this morning. You know, we use the expression, we talk about uh, how, you know, time flies. And I, I was thinking this, this week about, you know, when I was young, time just seemed to, to go very slowly. You know, when you're younger, whether you're waiting for your first tooth or whether you're waiting to graduate from high school or whether you're, I remember waiting to get my driver's license and it just seemed to take forever. I remember when Arlene and I, when she responded to my proposal of marriage and, and she said yes, and then it just seemed like it took forever for the wedding date to arrive. Or maybe it was the birth of your first child, and, you know, and, and time just seems sometimes to stand still and, and never really goes very quickly. But then as you get older, boy, time begins to move quickly. And I had one of those experiences this week because as I was thinking of our text in Ephesians chapter 2, I was reminded of an incident that happened that didn't seem really to be that long ago. And then I found out that it happened almost 10 years ago. I also didn't realize at the time, even though I remember the incident very vividly, that it happened, at least the beginning happened on our wedding anniversary on August the 5th. It was August the 5th, 2010. Now it was a story that gripped the world. And we all kind of just sat at the edge of our seats wondering and, for, and, and praying for a good resolution. Well, what happened? What happened was that in uh, a mine in northern Chile, there were 33 miners. The mine collapsed and 33 miners were trapped underground 700 meters. And in fact, they were, it was about five kilometers, apparently, from the actual entrance to the mine, given the ramps and, and, and so on. And so they were in this utterly desperate situation. And for the first couple of weeks, nobody knew whether they were dead or alive. A drill team uh, bored exploratory you know, holes, and it wasn't until 17 days after the collapse of the mine that a drill bill was pulled back to the surface and it had this amazing note on it. And the note was, we are well in the shelter, all 33 of us. Well, their rescue didn't happen in 17 days. In fact, it took altogether 67 days from the moment of the accident until ultimately it was October 13th, 2010 when they were one by one winched up to the surface, surface and, of course, saved. Well, our scripture text this morning that we're going to look at, it speaks of something that doesn't just, didn't just imperil 33 people for 67 days, but it speaks of something that was even more perilous and, and even more hopeless than the experience of the miners. 
that ultimately has impacted every single human being on our planet, but a situation that was remedied through the cross of Christ. Let's take a look at our text. The Apostle Paul begins this way, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. He says, as for you, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who was now at work in those who were disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. Now, remember, we're in a series in Ephesians, and we're calling the series, You Are Richer Than You Think. And we spent the last number of weeks focusing on Ephesians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul, again, remember, enumerates all of the blessings. Remember, blessed, you know, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the spiritual realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And, and he talks about them. And these blessings can be so incredibly helpful to us today. Ever felt rejected? Hey, he says you were chosen. God chose you, so you have value. Uh, do you ever deal with situations where, you, you, well, some of you grew up in homes that were difficult. Where this is Father's Day. Some of you have wonderful memories of your father. Others of you, boy, that's a, that's a tough memory. Some of you grew up without a father, and so there, there's been this void in your life. But listen, Paul says, you were, if you belong to Christ, you've been adopted into God's family. Uh, you're redeemed from slavery to sin. Your, your sins are forgiven. You've been brought into, in a sense, the very counsel of God, in, into the inner secrets of what life and eternity and past and going on in the present, what's going to happen in the future, that God is going to bring all things together in Christ. And we have come to experience that. We now understand that. We're given the Holy Spirit. Remember the down payment of our future inheritance. We even have the power of the Holy Spirit now, the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So, so Paul has been sort of building them up and, and, and just fortifying their faith and giving them courage and giving them confidence, which, by the way, was pretty important. Because remember, they were marginalized. They were a, a small little group of disparate house churches. They were living in Asia Minor. Some of them were little tiny house churches in the, the large, sophisticated city of Ephesus, a place of commerce, a, a place of great intellectual achievements. It was a place where, where there was this great temple to Artemis, the goddess of the Ephesians. It was a place of rampant immorality. And, and these new Christians probably looked at that and, and just wanted to go and run and maybe hide in a corner somewhere. They were in no position to share the message of Christ or to try to change the world. And, and Paul was so concerned for them that they understand that, you know, in Christ, you have a lot of wealth. In Christ, you are secure. Uh, there's an expression that says that where there is no hope for the future, there is no power in the present. And what Paul was wanting them to do 
was to have hope in their future so that they would experience that power that would enable them to continue to expand the kingdom of God and stay true to their faith in spite of, by the way, even the persecution that was present and was increasing. Okay, so, so we get that. Now, if that was what he was doing in chapter 1, but then aren't you a little puzzled, as, as I am, why does he now flip things in chapter 2? Because in chapter 2, it's almost like he has built them up in chapter 1 only to bring them crashing down in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he begins. You know what? You were dead. <laughs> you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And I was kind of pondering that. Well, remember last week we talked about the Joni Mitchell song. Remember that song that, that she wrote? It's a great environmental kind of song. Environmentalists love it. He says, remember that, that song that had this phrase, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. You know, you take paradise and you put up a parking lot. Well, in chapter one, what he wanted them to know is, again, this wealth, the privileges their inheritance, their identity in Christ, so that they would not discount it. They would not in any way ignore it or, or kind of cast it aside or go running off to some other thing that would attract them. No, he, he, he wanted them to know what they had in Jesus. But in chapter 2, he takes a different approach, but the intent is still the same. You see, one way for us to to, in a sense, fortify ourselves to stay true to Christ, is not only to dwell on the riches, the blessings, the forgiveness, the inheritance, the chosen, the adoption, all of these things that we have. But sometimes we have to also remember what we were like before. How desperate our situation was. How dark it was how perilous it was, how hopeless it was, how helpless we were. And that also enables us to appreciate even more fully the blessings we have in Christ. Now, as I was thinking of Ephesians 2, I was also reminded of how Sometimes we, we look at Ephesians 2, I think, as, as good evangelical Christians, and we immediately look at that and we say, well, this is a text that really is, an, if you like, an evangelistic text, and countless evangelistic sermons have been preached on it. But if, is that all that it is? You know, back in 1962, there was a Presbyterian pastor by the name of James Kennedy, and he created, a, 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 if you like, a system or a program of evangelism training. It's it, an outstanding evangelism training. I took it in the early 70s. And James Kennedy kind of built it on a couple of key questions. One of the questions was this. And by the way, it's a great question to consider if you're watching this morning and you're not really sure if you're a Christian or not. The question is this. Have you come to the place in your own spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven. By the way, it's possible to know that. And depending how a person would respond, he would, well, we would go to the second question. And the second question was this, suppose you were to die today you, and stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And you see, commonly people's responses, even today, Maybe online you might be thinking this. Commonly people would say, well, because I'm, I think I live a good moral life or uh, I think I've got as good a chance as any. I don't cheat on my taxes. I try to be a good parent or I try to work hard. I don't cheat, lie, steal, whatever. In other words, usually the focus is on our own good behavior. And if there is the recognition that ah, we've done a few things that maybe weren't quite right, sins of various kinds, well, God will overlook them because surely the good is going to outweigh the bad. Well, guess what? Ephesians chapter 2 can be pretty brutal in exposing the fallacy of that position. Paul's, what he says to the Ephesians is, listen, he said, you were what? You were dead 
in your transgressions and sins. Now, now that's, that, that's pretty unkind, but that is the message. But, but, but it's important to get it because when we start to understand that message, then it helps us to recognize why it is that Jesus Christ came, why it is that we need forgiveness, why it is important to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, no, we, we kind of get that as Christians. And, and if you're maybe kind of considering the Christian faith, maybe that's helpful to you in understanding as we begin to move forward. But what I want us to recognize is the vast majority of us watching this right now, we are believers in Christ. And you see, what the Apostle Paul is wanting you and me to understand is not just that this is a situation of those who are not yet believers. He wants us to recognize that this was what you and I were like. And it's important that we understand this so that we can come more fully to appreciate the mercy of the grace of God that we have experienced. Because when we do grasp that, we will be filled with that gratitude. We will have this longing to live in a life that's worthy of our calling. And all the demands that the Apostle Paul is going to make further in the letter to the church at Ephesus. You see, these commands are going to start to make sense. And, and we, we want to do these things, not because it earns our favor with God, because Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 says, no, there, there was nothing that you and I could do. Like the miners 700 meters under the ground, there was nothing that they could do. Their only hope was a rescue. And the only hope, based on what we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, the only hope is the rescue that God provided in Christ. You know, we could summarize Ephesians 1 to 2, or chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, you know, very simply with, with three questions. One is, what were we like before we were rescued? We could then look at the whole question of how were we rescued? And then we could, of course, consider the question why were we rescued? But we're going to look at the why next week more. But we're going to focus more on question one and maybe just touch a little bit on question number two. Well, what were we like before we were rescued? The Apostle Paul, again, he doesn't try to in any way whitewash it, doesn't want to make us look better than we were. He says, no, he says, you were dead. You were dead in transgressions and sins. You know, there's an attitude today that Again, spirituality is a good thing. I mean, aren't we all spiritual? It doesn't really matter what it is. You just have to sort of explore your spiritual self. As though we can sort of make ourselves spiritually alive. Well, the Apostle Paul says, no, the biblical message is this. That when we sin, whether intentionally, whether unintentionally, he says, no, the wages of sin is death. It's spiritual death. When you're dead... You cannot one day decide and wake up one morning and say, I am going to be spiritually alive. And from that moment, I become a spiritual person. No, he says, listen, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, transgressions is an interesting term. It, it, it essentially means, well, we talk about forgive us our trespasses. It's crossing into forbidden territory. Sin is an archery term that means missing a mark. Failure to live up not only to our own standards, but ultimately the standards of God. Sometimes there are sins that we call of commission, things we do, that are sins. And there are sins of omission, things that we should do. And we know the target we should be aiming at, but we actually miss it. And we do it by omission. There was an interesting incident that happened in 2018. It was May 21st. There was a, a young woman who was a jogger. She was from France, but she was living, or, or rather traveling in British Columbia, and she was in the White Rock area. She was jogging at the beach. While she was jogging on the sand, she ended up actually jogging unintentionally across the border into the United States, and she was apprehended by the border guards. Of course, she pled ignorance. I didn't intend to do it. Well, she ended up spending two weeks in an American, or in jail, uh, and of course, the 
border officials that took quite a bit of time to resolve and figure out what to do with this young woman. Now, in her case, she trespassed, but she did it unintentionally. But the Apostle Paul here, what he's describing, what we were like before we came to Christ, he says, listen, he says, no, he says, it wasn't an, an unintended trespass. Notice the sequence. He says, you, you used to live this way. Literally, he means you, you were walking in this way following the ways of the world, following the crowd, the ruler, you know, of the air, the kingdom of the air, well, that ultimately is Satan. It, I, I kind of hear echoes here of Psalm 1. Remember, blessed is the man who, what, doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand on the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. And he says, no, he says, you were dead. You, you were, this is the way you were living, and, and it was kind of a habitual thing. Now, some of us might be saying, or some of his readers might have been saying, oh, come on, Paul, you're being really hard on us. And then Paul makes the astonishing statement. He says, all of us, he says, we're living this way, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Now, now when you're thinking of cravings of the sinful nature, what comes to mind? I mean, obviously, and most of us probably right now are thinking, oh, yeah, but talking about sexual desire or talking about sexual sin. Well, it could refer to any craving of bodily desires. It can be the craving for food, the craving for sleep, the craving for sex or any other, you know, physical desires. The biblical message is not that desire itself is sinful. God has given us a physical body. Pleasure is something that God is not opposed to. But these desires are still to be exercised within boundaries. These desires are, in a sense, to be our servants, but they're not to be our masters. But when they begin to dominate our lives, then ultimately they take the supreme place. They become idolatrous. And the Apostle Paul says, no, we were giving in to these cravings. Now, there, there's something that also is really quite amazing as, as we read the text, because, you know, we, we immediately think of these desires as physical. But in Philippians chapter 3, when Paul is reflecting back on his life before he was rescued by Christ, he uses a phrase, he talks about confidence in the flesh. In a sense, he's talking about his own sinful life before. And he says, listen, if anybody had reason, you know, to be confident in his old nature before he came to Christ, he said, I have more reason. And then he goes on and he describes what some of these cravings were, these desires, these things that dominated his life. And things like self-confidence, pride of ancestry, parentage, race, religion, even righteousness according to the Jewish law. Now, what, what is interesting to me is that what he's getting at is this, that when we're talking about the cravings of the sinful nature, we're not only talking about our physical appetites. We're talking about attitudes of superiority, thinking we're better than someone else, looking down on other people. Incidentally, the whole racism debate that's going on right now there is no place, no place in the heart of a genuine child of God for any attitude of entitlement or superiority or pride in ourselves, in our ethnicity, in our color, in our nationality or any other such thing. You see, these kind of attitudes are part of what Paul describes as these cravings of the sinful nature. And they are an absolute violation of the gospel. We'll look at this more in days to come, but when Paul said, listen, God's intent is to bring all things together in Christ, it is in Christ that these divisions Barriers are taken down. By the way, in Galatians chapter 5, he, he discusses and explores these things even further. He says, you know, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And okay, what's coming to mind? Well, he does describe some that are familiar. Things like sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. And then he gets into hatred, 
discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And then, so, so what is he saying? He's saying, listen, before we came to Christ, all humanity, everyone on the planet inherited the sinful nature of Adam. And what's, what's it characterized by? These kind of worldly attitudes, fleshly desires, these cravings of the sinful nature, anger, discord, one-upmanship, superiority, any of these things. The very things that we see happening all over the place every time we look at them, watch the news today. You see, that was the situation before, he says. But what happened? What happened? He said, well, not only this is what we were like, this is what humanity was like, he says, before. But he said this, he said, we were rescued from such a state. And how did it happen? Just two words. Two words. You know, you don't see it in the English version because in the English version, it, it goes on and it talks, but, you know, being rich in mercy, God. But in the Greek language, it begins very simply this. He's given us this dark picture, dead in transgressions, following the ways of the world, the ruler of the council of the air, but God. But God, who was what? Because of his great love for us who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins. By grace, you have been saved. Someone has described grace as what? God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Even when we were dead in transgressions and sins, God made us alive in Christ. By grace, he says, you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved. This is not of yourselves. It is through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works. Notice, so that no one can boast. And here, I think, is the key to understanding Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. You see, he's built them up, told them in chapter 1 how wealthy they were, how blessed they were. But Ephesians chapter 2, in a sense, he brings them back down to earth because he doesn't want them to have an inflated view of themselves. He wants them to have a proper view of themselves, but not a human arrogance and hubris, pride, no, he says, listen, but there is no room for boasting. There's no sense of superiority here because it is only the grace of God in Christ that makes you presentable and ultimately worthy in the sight of God. You see, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, we were dead in transgressions and sins. We were in peril. We were helpless. We were hopeless. God had a rescue plan. And he took our transgressions, our trespasses, our sins, our failures. And he placed them all on Christ. So that through Christ, we could be saved through faith, which is also not of ourselves. All of this, the whole package, is the gift of God so that no one can boast. You see, this text 
is an evangelistic text, sure. And if you're here this morning, and if I were to say, listen, if God were to ask you, you were to die today, stand before God, and he were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? I hope you've come to realize right now that you could not say to God, because I'm a good person. No. You can't compensate for your sin by acts of goodness. It's not that goodness itself is not good. The point is, no, we cannot make ourselves spiritually alive. But when we put our trust in Christ and what he did for us on the cross, that's the moment that we are born again spiritually. That's the moment that we are recreated in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But again, brothers and sisters, this is not just a text that's an evangelistic text. It's a text for me and for you. It's a text that we must understand in order to fully appreciate the gospel, in order to appreciate what we have in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2 helps us to understand how blessed we are. But also Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that we are not superior to anyone else. The only appropriate attitude for a true follower of Christ is an attitude of incredible gratitude to the Father and an attitude of humility towards all other people because we have no grounds for boasting. By the way, dads, you want to be a good father? Take some time, meditate on these truths. Understand what you also were like until Christ rescued you. And then as one who belongs to Christ, do, empowered by the Holy Spirit, listen, characterize, be characterized now by what? By, by love and by mercy and by grace to your own children, let them see the character of your Heavenly Father by seeing it in you. Back in the mid 16, 1600s, there was a fellow uh, who was, his name was John Bradford, actually it was the mid 16th century. He was an English reformer. He was eventually martyred because of his faith in Christ. But on one occasion, John Bradford was, was walking in the city, and he must have been close to the, to the city jail. And he, and he saw a parade, a small parade of prisoners who were on their way to be executed. Well, what was John Bradford's attitude as he looked at them? Did he, did he look down on them? Did he see himself as somehow you know, superior to them morally? Not at all. You see, John Bradford obviously understood the truth of the gospel, of what Christ had done in his life. He recognized that all that he had was something that was a gift. It was God's grace. It wasn't something that he deserved. And he looked at the, this parade of prisoners on their way to the gallows. And he said these words, There but for the grace of God goes John Bradford. There but for the grace of God goes John Bradford. You see, when we embrace, when we understand the immensity of our peril and the lavishness of God's grace, the rescue, when we come to recognize it, what we were apart from Christ, how it is that God rescued us in Christ, that, that impacts the way we not only see ourselves, but it has massive implications for the way we treat the people around us, those outside of Christ, and even those that we might find more difficult who are also fellow believers. You see, we look at them 
We can sometimes even look at bad behavior. We could even look at things that people might do to us, but we can say, there but for the grace of God. That could have been me. There but for the grace of God go I. But any good that is within me, all glory goes to Jesus. Shall we pray? Loving Father, I thank you today. Lord, for that incredible grace of Christ. Father, I thank you for the riches that we have in Jesus. But I also thank you, Lord, for this text that reminds us of just where we all were apart from Christ. But that rescue that you provided, Lord, may in turn we just be stripped of all boasting or arrogance or any sense of entitlement or superiority to anyone else. And Father, fill us with the fruit of your Spirit, that we would be people characterized by humility, by gentleness, by kindness, that we would be people, Father, characterized by, by goodness, people of peace, people who demonstrate the love of Christ. Father, we thank you. And on this Father's Day, I pray in particular, Lord, for the fathers who are watching, that, Lord, you would so work in us by the power of your Spirit to also be men who are characterized Father, by gentleness and by love and by mercy and by grace so that our children and to some of us, our grandchildren, Father, will see the very character of our Heavenly Father manifested in our lives. Father, we love you. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Trinity, as we can conclude our worship time, now may the love of God, your Heavenly Father, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and also the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen.